Good morning. I'm Councilmember Margaret Chin, Chair of the Committee on Aging. Thank you all for joining us today for the committee's first hearing of the 2018 to 2021 session. I'm proud of the progress we have made for the seniors in our city over the last four years and look forward to continued progress in the next four years. As New York City's senior population rapidly increases, every year must be the year of the senior to ensure that the city supports senior growing needs. Today, we will talk about one of those needs, minor home repairs for seniors who choose to age in place. As we know, seniors generally prefer to remain in their homes and their communities where they have built their lives. And research shows that aging in place allows seniors, among other things, to maintain their independence, reduce the cost of care, and avoid social isolation. However, senior homeowners and renters may face challenges as they age in place with housing maintenance and repairs, such as seemingly simple tasks, such as changing a light bulb or more complicated, complex upkeeps like weatherization needs. Seniors may also need help making the necessary modification to their homes, including but not limited to installing handrails, slip resistant floors, and winding doorways and hallways, which will allow them to age in place safely. Today, we will hear from the Department for the Aging and the Department of Housing Preservation and Development, advocates and other interested stakeholders about the housing repair and maintenance needs of seniors who choose to stay in the communities they help build the resources available to them, and how the city can expand those resources. I'd like to thank the committee staff for their help in putting together this hearing, our policy analyst, Emily Rooney, our counsel, Kathleen Fahey, and finance analyst, Daniel Krupp. And I'd like to thank uh, the other members of the committee who have joined us here today. We have Council Member Verlone from Queens and Council Member Diaz from the Bronx. Oh, and Council Member Rose from Staten Island. <laughs> Welcome. Okay. It's pretty close, right, Council Member Rose, to Lower Manhattan. So we're going to invite up uh, the first panel, Karen Taylor and Kim Daga from HPD, Karen Taylor from DIFTA. And our council will sway you in. Thank you. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. Good morning. Chairperson Chin and members of the Aging Committee, I'm Karen Taylor, Assistant Commissioner for the Bureau of Community Services at the New York City Department for the Aging, or DIFTA. I'm joined today by colleagues from the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development and the Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities. On behalf of Commissioner Donna Corrado, I would like to thank you for this opportunity to discuss aging in place and home repairs for seniors. Seniors represent the fastest growing segment of New York City's population. In 2015, New York City's population aged 60 and older comprised nearly 1.6 million adults, or approximately 19% of the city's population. By 2040, New York City's 60 and older population will significantly increase to a projected 1.86 million, an increase of almost 50% from the year 2000. Older adults who were less than one in every six New Yorkers in 2000 will be more than one in every five in 2040. In addition, as individuals age, their range of mobility decreases and need for appropriate in-home services, adaptive equipment, and the least restrictive environment also increases. In 2015, 36% of all older New Yorkers reported some level of disability, including physical disabilities that affected walking, climbing stairs, reaching, or lifting, conditions that restricted their ability to go outside the home, mental, cognitive, or emotional conditions, limitations in their ability to perform self-care activities, such as dressing and bathing, 
hearing loss, and vision loss. Aging in place, the term, describes uh, individuals who are continuing to live in their homes as they age rather than relocating. A majority of older persons prefer to age in place. In New York City, 96% of older adults are currently aging in place in non-institutional settings. As the population of older New Yorkers continues to increase, homes and communities become more and more important in the aging process as well. Recognizing the vast majority of older New Yorkers, that, that the vast majority of older New Yorkers are aging in place, intro number 702-A of, of 2015, introduced by former council speaker Mark Viverito and Chair Chin, was signed by the mayor in June of that year as Local Law 51. <clears throat> the law required DIFTA in consultation with HPD, the Department of Buildings, the Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities, relevant businesses, and nonprofit organizations to create a guide for building owners regarding aging in place. As part of Age Friendly NYC, DIFTA contracted with the American Institute of Architects New York Chapter Design for Aging Committee, or the DFA, in collaboration with housing experts from across the public and private sector to produce this guide. In 2006, DIFTA issued the Aging in Place Guide for Building Owners, recommended age-friendly residential building upgrades. I believe we have some copies here today. <clears throat> the guide recommends residential building modifications to accommodate older tenants. By making these improvements, building owners can help residents remain in their homes as they age, safely, comfortably, and independently. While the recommendations are made with older adults in mind, many of the su suggested improvements would make buildings and apartments more livable for residents of all ages. In addition, the uh, AIA Design for Aging Committee secured grant funding to translate the Aging in Place Guide into English, Spanish, and Chinese. Central to the agency's, to DIFTA's mission, is to ensure the dignity and quality of life in New York City's diverse older adults. DIFTA is deeply committed to assisting older adults so they may age safely in their homes and remain, remain actively engaged in their lives and their communities. The agency's minor, repair, uh, minor Residential Repairs Program, or MRRP, is a small but essential component of DIFTA's portfolio of services aimed at assisting older adults in remaining independent and safe in their homes. Currently, DIFTA contracts with the New York Foundation for Senior Citizens for the Minor Residential Repairs Program. This program has provided more than 6,000 hours of service annually, and in FY17 served 2,505 seniors. MRRP is designed to assist low and moderate income homeowners in maintaining their residences by providing res residential repairs and upkeep tasks. Eligible homeowners are defined as older adults, age 60 and older, older, owning a one to four family home or a unit in a co-op building or a condominium. On a limited basis and with explicit consent of the landlord and after attempts have been made to have the landlord make a repair, the program can assist renters as well. As this program is funded through the Federal Community Development Block Grant, <clears throat> excuse me, or CDBG, 51% of the recipients must be of low and moderate, low or moderate income, as defined by Section 8 income limits. Although, in fact, about 75% of the seniors served for this program have either low or very low incomes. CDBG is a federal block grant allocated to states and local governments based on a formula to address a wide variety of community de development needs. <clears throat> After an in-home assessment is conducted by a social worker, repair staff members are assigned to perform one or more various tasks in the person's home and or on the person's property. The social worker and other support staff of the program are key to the success of the program. As they determine eligibility, they seek to understand and evaluate the person's mental and physical well-being, assess the underlying causes for disrepair, and identify potential issues that they may, that may, may need to be addressed. <clears throat> the program staff have an understanding of and linkages with other community-based programs for possible referrals and additional needed interventions. 
MRRP can assist eligible homeowners and to a very limited extent renters with minor residential repairs, which include safety and security, which could be installation of locks, window gates, other security features, repairing screens, window panes, installing smoke alarms and carbon monoxide detectors, plumbing issues such as faucet repair and installation, unclogging drains, toilet repairs, <clears throat> carpentry such as loose floorboards, stairs and securing stairs and railings and treads for stairs, some electrical and heating, minor non-structural electrical repairs such as, as uh, Council Member Chen mentioned changing a light bulb that is out of the reach of a senior uh, or addressing minor heating and cooling problems. Home maintenance, cleaning and repair of drain pipes and gutters, painting and patching of walls and ceilings. Some masonry for homeowners in minor cementing, plastering and patching, weatherization, which uh, for instance caulking windows, installing weather stripping, home safety, installing handrails, grab bars and other safety devices. Minor, repair, minor problems in one's home often lead to bigger issues later on if unaddressed, but older adults may find the process of hiring plumbers, contractors, or electricians overwhelming, as many of us do, and the prospect of admitting strangers into their homes intimidating. Seniors who are frail or disabled are often more susceptible to crimes, including financial scams, and thus may avoid situations that would increase their sense of vulnerability. Cost is also a factor in not addressing problems immediately. Seniors often live on a fixed income with very limited disposable funds to address problems that arise. This free service addresses these issues and other common concerns. A concept paper for the um, minor residential repair program was issued last May and an RFP for the program released last November. The New York Foundation for Senior Citizens submitted the winning proposal and the new contract for this program is expected to start in July of 2018. The contract is for 1.25 million for the three year term or $417,000 annually. There's also Project Metropair. This is a program sponsored by the Metropolitan Coordinating Council on Jewish Poverty, funded by the New York City Council um, is a free home safety and security program for older adults and people with disabilities throughout all five boroughs of New York City. The goal of the program is to upgrade the soundness of a client's residence to improve its structural integrity and safety. Highly skilled and fully equipped, Metropair service technicians travel throughout the city to provide clients with necessary repairs. Metropair program prevents illness and injury, prevents or postpones institutional institutionalization and improves the overall quality of life for services. Similar to the New York Foundations program, uh, Metropair also performs tasks such as installing locks, peepholes, doorbells, window guards, and other security related hardware, smoke alarms, carbon monoxide detectors, inspo installing bathroom, bath, excuse me, bathroom grab bars, fixing washers and leaky faucets, light carpentry work, fixing damaged drywall, repairing or replacing flooring in small areas, painting or plastering in small areas. Additionally, Metropair staff refer the older adult clients to Met Council for their social service needs when necessary and appropriate. This program enables seniors to live independently and remain in their homes longer and also reduces medical bills. Metropair served a total of 1,191 clients in FY17. Moving on to Age Friendly NYC, since its inception, Age Friendly NYC, a partnership of the administration, the council, and the New York Academy of Medicine, has made access to safe, accessible, and affordable housing a priority. In addition to Aging in Place Guide, there are a number of other age-friendly initiatives that help older adults remain in their homes and communities as they age, including the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene offers a Healthy Homes for Older Adults training program on specific risk factors for injury and illness and best practices for prevention. Topics include fire, falls, pests, and heat illnesses. The training is provided to health and social service providers who work with older adults in the home in order to improve their understanding of the burden of home environmental risks. 
The Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities uh, released the Inclusive Design Guidelines, New York City, second edition, or the IDG, last year, in collaboration with the International Code Council. The aim of the IDG is to create more user-friendly and safe building and landscapes that improve the quality of life for everyone, including children, older adults, and individual, other individuals with disabilities. The IDG offers technical guidance to help designers produce multi-sensory enhanced environments that accommodate the diverse range of physical and mental abilities of all ages. Recommendations in the IDG can be applied for all use and occupancy classifications, particularly residential and commercial buildings. Project Open House, also administered by MOPD, is a home modification program designed to increase independence in the activities of daily living, thus helping people with disabilities remain a part of their communities. Individual eligibility is determined by evaluating income and disability and also is on a first come, first served basis. MOPD conducts outreach in the disability community to seek participants and partners with HPD to operate Pro Project Open House to increase accessibility in the homes of people with disabilities. For FY17, Project Open House received 102 applications. Services provided include bathroom modifications and installation of a vertical platform lift, handrails, and automatic operated doors. The Department of Consumer Affairs distributes a tip sheet that provides recommendations for home improvement contractors to consider the special needs and circumstances of older adults when making repairs and how they can help older New Yorkers live more safely at home. It's available online in English and Spanish and DCA also distributes the tip sheet as part of the Home Improvement Contractor License Application packet at the DCA Licensing Center and New York City Small Business Support Center. So thank you again for the opportunity to testify on aging in place and home repairs for seniors. And I'm pleased to answer any other questions you may have. Thank you. And uh, we've also been joined by uh, Council Member Ayala and uh, Council Member Drum. All right, we're going to. Oh, yes. Um, HPD have a testimony too? Yes. Uh, good morning, Chair Chen and members of the committee. My name is Kim Darga. I am the Associate Commissioner for Preservation at the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development. I appreciate the opportunity to testify on the steps HPD is taking towards supporting New York's senior citizens as they age in place in HPD-supported affordable housing. Since Mayor de Blasio launched the Housing New York Plan in 2014, New York City has accelerated the construction and preservation of affordable housing to levels not seen in 30 years but we know that we can do more. With the foundation built these last four years, HPD is now positioned to speed up and expand on Housing New York and our original goal of constructing or preserving 200,000 homes by 2024. Now, with Housing New York 2.0, we will accelerate and expand the plan to build or preserve an additional 100,000 units for a total of 300,000 homes by 2026. As part of Housing New York 2.0, HPD is doubling down on our commitment to serve the city, city's seniors. Uh, to expand affordable housing options for seniors, the administration committed as part of Housing New York to create or preserve 15,000 senior homes and apartments. Through our new expanded plan, we will now be serving a total of 30,000 senior households residing in affordable apartments. To meet this additional commitment, we are launching, launching Seniors First, a three-pronged strategy to better serve seniors. Uh, first, uh, make more homes accessible to seniors and people with disabilities. Second, build new 100% affordable senior developments on underused NYCHA land and other public and private sites. And third, preserve existing senior housing developments. These initiatives will increase the number of affordable senior housing units within the city, as well as improve the ability of seniors who live in affordable housing today to age comfortably and safely in their current home. Today, I would like to focus on our commitment to making improvements and modifications in the affordable senior homes over the course of the next eight years. This will enable, enable seniors to stay in their home uh, and community as they age and create inclusive neighborhoods for people with disabilities. 
To meet this goal, we are expanding the requirements for preservation projects, which are existing buildings that receive funding for <coughs> renovations and agree to adopt regulatory protections for residents. New HPD-funded rehabilitation projects will be required to include accessibility improvements and their scope of work, identified through an enhanced building physical needs assessment. Buildings will now be assessed through a holistic lens that not only identifies basic building system needs, like a roof or heating system, but also building-wide improvements to help seniors age safely in their homes. In addition to the building-wide assessment, we will be offering existing senior residents modifications within their home to help these residents live more comfortably and reduce risk of falls. Simple changes can make staying in one's home a viable, safer option and create a more accessible city for all New Yorkers, making it possible for seniors to stay in the home they live in, many of whom who have lived in their home for decades. It is an important anti-displacement tool as we work toward protecting our more vulnerable residents. We are very excited to launch this historic initiative and look forward to sharing our progress with Council when the rollout is further along. HPD is excited to build on previous successful collaborations with uh, DIFTA through our expanded focus on seniors, and we are grateful for the information and assistance they have offered on our new tool to help uh, the seniors in our portfolio age in place. As DIFTA mentioned in their testimony, we were part of the advisory committee for DIFTA's Aging in Place Guide for Building Owners. HPD believes it's an important, uh, sorry, is a tremendous resource for private landlords who are interested in making changes to their buildings to enable their residents to continue living in their homes as they age and their needs shift. It is one of the aging in place guides that we are referencing as we develop our Seniors First initiative. HPD is constantly looking for new ways to support uh, seniors in our affordable housing portfolio, preserve existing affordable senior housing, and create new opportunities for senior housing. Our HUD multifamily program provides resources for owners of HUD-assisted senior housing, including HUD 202 properties, to ensure uh, the buildings remain affordable and in good condition. In the last few years, uh, we have expanded work with HUD to reach out to and engage with building owners to make sure that they're aware of how the city and federal government can help. Our new construction term sheets encourage intergenerational housing, and we are now seeing some of the first projects close as a result of the Zoning for Quality and Affordability Amendment, which makes it easier and less expensive to create quality, affordable senior housing. We recently released three RFPs for dedicated affordable senior housing on NYCHA land, and we have continued to add to our affordable senior housing stock through our Senior Affordable Rental Apartments Program, known as SARA. We're also working to launch our Housing Plus initiative designed to add new housing on underutilized land while addressing the rehabilitation and financing needs of existing developments, which will provide opportunities for senior housing through ZQA. At the same time as HPD works on strategies to create and preserve affordable senior units, the city has also been working hard to increase enrollment in SCREE which freezes rents for seniors living in rent-regulated apartments through an increased income eligibility level and dedicated outreach. This helps ensure that more of our seniors living in rent-regulated apartments can stay in their homes and the city they love without fear of being displaced by escalating rents. We are encouraged by the progress that we have been able to achieve over the last four years through Housing New York and are excited to see how the results of our strong commitments going forward for the next four years under our Housing New York 2.0. Thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Good. Thank you. It's good to hear that um, the year of the senior is catching on. Now we have senior first <laughs> in HPD. So that's great to hear. Um, I'm going to have my colleagues start off with asking some questions. Uh, Council Member Vallon. And we've been joined by Council Member Traeger. We have a full house today. We do. Thank you. I think first we should congratulate our chair for once again leading the aging committee on for the month of term. We're very happy to follow in your lead and continue on with the year of the senior for every year. And once again, good morning. Good to see everyone. Um, a lot of these programs that you're talking about are, are, are very good, but they're very limited. So I wanted to know your thoughts on the possibility of expanding either the program, the funding, or raising the eligibility requirements, such as the, the income limitations that many of our seniors don't meet. 
I'm not sure which of the programs you're talking about. Just about any one of them okay. is limited to either <laughs> I'll, disability I'll or, or income, which knocks out just about 99% of Queens County. So, Well, in terms of the um, program, the minor residential repair program that uh, is funded with uh, community development block grant funds, the income is set by HUD, actually. Um, the uh, eligibility is if you, you know, it's 60 and above, but the income eligibility is, is part of the community development block grant regulation. So it has to be for 51% low and moderate income as according to Section 8 guidelines. So we don't have a lot of flexibility in that particular program for raising income, but there are plenty of takers of the program that do fall within that, um, that income range. So does the city have any plans on having an independent program separate from federal HUD funding? The DIFTA does uh, fund about 10% of this program, but um, at the current, currently we don't have additional funds to put into an expansion or uh, an additional program do we have on any minor repair. Do we have any numbers on seniors that are benefiting or actually getting, yes. are applying to the program? Yes, we do. Um, let's see if I can. There were, uh, the, the most complete numbers we have for FY17, for the New York Foundation's minor residential repair program, there were 2,505 seniors, or households, but seniors that benefited. And with the Met Council, the, uh, the council-funded program, the city council-funded program, uh, I believe there are 1,191 seniors that benefited. In total for the five boroughs? That's in total. Uh, I do have stats by borough. If you want me to read them out, I sure. can. I hope they add up to what the numbers I just gave you. <laughs> I won't hold you to <laughs> Okay, don't get your calculators out, please. Um, for the minor residential repair, the New York Foundation, this is our baseline funded program. Uh, there were uh, five in Manhattan. Okay. <laughs> Brooklyn, 676. Queens, 1,008. Bronx, 162, and Staten Island, 654, which I think has a lot to do with the type of housing and uh, home ownership uh, in the boroughs. For Metro Pair, Manhattan was 141, uh, 827 in Brooklyn, 158 in Queens, 45 in the Bronx, and 20 in Staten Island. So the programs had slightly different areas of focus. Well, I, I mean, those, the numbers basically speak for themselves. We, yep. we have a lot of work to do. Um, I don't even think that really plan comes out to a citywide plan when you have no, dozens and hundreds of people benefiting when I have on one block mm -hmm. uh, more than that. So I think we really have to relook what aging in place means to the largest demographic in the city. And if anyone has any work, which we all do in this room, that's why we're here and working with seniors, their homes are not up to the latest standards of safety standards. They don't have the funding to make the changes, nor do they have, most of the time, the ability or a family member to step up for them. So mm -hmm. these are critical steps that I think, and not tons of money either, mm -hmm. that we can really make a difference in the quality of life of mm -hmm. our seniors and allowing them to age with grace and independence and dignity at home, so I for one, and I know our chair um, joins in this, is to do everything we can to increase these programs, um, not just limit them to HUD guidelines, and actually as a city set a standard that other cities would follow to say, okay, the federal government's only doing this, but we have the largest demographic of seniors, we're gonna do this mm -hmm. on top. Um, that's one, and two, I guess, you, you stated in your testimony that even with these limited programs, an assessment is done mm -hmm. when they go to the home. Mm -hmm. And I think Council Member Chin and I have talked for years now about collecting critical and essential data when a visit is made on any type of door knock for a senior. And too often that data is not used when it can be used for many future purposes. Mm -hmm. Is any of this data maintained or shared by any other agencies? The data that's uh, um, gathered. That's why you're smiling, because <laughs> you knew I was going to ask. I said, that's why you're smiling. No, beca because I think that's a very important question. Because as I said, um, repairs 
may be just the result of an aging apartment or an aging house, but they could also be a sign of other problems for the senior as well. And so in both of these programs, there is a very strong emphasis on social services and referrals for other services that are needed when they go in to assess the condition of the, of the home. Uh, you know, uh, the assessment can be made as to whether the repair is really the only problem there. And if not, then referrals are made. Both of these programs have many other social service, uh, social services available as well as know their, um, the resources in their communities. So seniors are also linked with and hooked up to other Do we have any of the needed. data if any of these if any of these assessments led to a referral to another agency? We have for social some very services? very limited data, but I think I rather than um, kind of speculate, we can pull that together and get back to you on that. Well that might be a way we can expand a program that's limited in its scope to actually achieve additional purposes mm -hmm. that maybe whether it's through training or at least if on site that the person going to provide the service that we can then flag and automatically start some type of follow-up referral program with another social service or a family member to mm -hmm. alert them, which goes back to another battle Margaret Chen and I have been having for years of creating some type of emergency contact right. information per senior. I think the Department of Health and Mental Health uh, program I mentioned also is working on that as well by training social service agencies on how to, what to look for when they uh, regarding home repair when they do go in to do assessments and in-home services. Um, I don't know if any of my colleagues want to comment on some of the other programs or not, but um, I think point well taken. Is that something that we can possibly achieve? Is that something we can push for? I think if we're, if we're making those contacts and it's so hard to get to our, everyone in the city, it's impossible. But for someone who's actually reaching out, and we're starting some type of data collection about that visit, I think that would be a great first step as to creating this contact system for our seniors as to what the needs are for the seniors of the people in the city of New York, whether it might just be fixing a handrail, but it probably could lead to there's no food in the refrigerator, mm -hmm. or we don't have access to greater important things of health care and uh, emergency in their services. So there's an opportunity here with a limited program, even with one like this, which mm -hmm. is why I think it's important that we can use this to now create a subset within this program. Mm -hmm. I would be happy to talk further with you on that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then the last was your, something else that the chair um, and the council fought for was the age-friendly NYC. We even contributed funding for it. Uh, I know our district participated in it, and we were made, as were many other districts and throughout the city, age-friendly qualified because of the district. There was a lot of work that went into that. We had a lot of town halls, we had a lot of meetings, a lot of excitement by our seniors and the communities and the community boards got involved. The four points that you list here are the results of the age-friendly NYC program is that they were training program with specific risk factors inclusive design guidelines, home modification program designs, and a tip sheet. That is not what an age-friendly district needs. So we, we went through this process of detailing what a district needs for seniors, for increased transportation, for, for our senior centers, for our parks to have benches, for our mental health capability, for our um, aging in place guidelines, for our um, shelter programs. All of that was things that were designed. So I'm, I'm, I'm dismayed that the bullet points of the age-friendly NYC result were limited to these things that really don't help at all. Is it, the data, we did a lot of data collection on the age-friendly and the district was excited about it. It's hard for us as council members to go back to the district and say, hey, we did all this work and nothing came out of it. We came with recommendations for parks departments, for projects. And do we have any way that we're gonna revisit the age-friendly program and or look at some of the data that was collected through it? First, and I, I don't mean to sound too defensive, but these were just some points that were uh, that we felt were particularly relevant to residential repair and in-home modifications. Um, but the age-friendly district 
uh, process was really was led by the New York Academy of Medicine, and uh, then the initiatives were led by the agencies. But uh, there's obviously a lot more to the Age Friendly NYC initiative. That's a, the, it's a huge, um, you know, like a huge process. But these were just some examples of programs that came out of that initiative that relate specifically to the uh, topic of this hearing. So then I'll, I'll just wrap up and hand back over to the chair. I think there's a lot of opportunity because we did the work already mm -hmm. in specific communities throughout the city determining what the age-friendly needs are for seniors in the city of New York and then breaking it down by borough and then breaking it down by neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, that now the next step is actually funding those neighborhoods to achieve those needs. And I think instead of wasting that great data that we got, and this might be related to home repairs, but that's an essential part of keeping mm -hmm. aging in place. I think we need to not let that data just say, okay, we did that. We need to do something about it and actually produce. And I think you have 51 council members who would happily include, and even in their budgets, some initiatives for a new park that would include some age friendly for their schools and the parks around them, for the transportation alternatives or the lack thereof, it goes on and on. Mm -hmm. But we can partner up to make sure, God bless you, to make sure those happen. So I'd, I'd look forward to working and revisiting the information through the Age Friendly Program. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Council Member Drum, you have a question? Thank you very much. Ooh, wow. Am I on? Yeah, there you go. One, oh. Okay. I, re I really only have um, one question, and it's an issue that I've brought up um, before, and actually I have some proposed legislation on it as well, and it's an issue that's been brought to me by a number of the seniors who live in my district, and it, it's, not, uh, it's, not, it's not a home repair, but it's a home issue, and that is the issue of bed bugs. And uh, the extermination of bed bugs is one part of it, and sometimes that in itself is a problem. But the other piece of it is um, moving furniture to get to the bed bugs. And what has happened is that in buildings where they do have regular extermination all the time, um, they'll come in three, four, five times, six times or whatever, but they can never really get to the root of the problem because they can't get behind the furniture or move it and the seniors can't move it. In one case in my district, there was like a 93-year-old woman living with like a 70-year-old daughter and neither one of them could really move the, this, the, uh, the furniture. And then interestingly enough, I got a call from um, somebody in one of the southern states of the country who had seen my legislation online, um, and uh, she told me a story about uh, an aunt who lives on the Upper West Side who had paid thousands of dollars to have people come in and move the furniture uh, and to do the extermination, and she had to do that on numerous occasions. So, even the issue of who comes in and does the exterminating for seniors, I think sometimes people take advantage of them as well, that they don't do a complete and full um, good job. So is there anything within uh, this program that addresses that issue? And if not, is there anything in the agency that's looking at addressing this issue? Well, as I understand it, as you said, you know, there is legislation that is, um, that is, that you, I guess you have proposed, and I, I think we'd be happy to talk with you offline a little bit more about that. It's, uh, the, the programs that we have here are not specific to bed bugs. They're really about more, or, or pests, but, um, but it, what you bring up is an interesting and a very important point, so I'd be happy to talk to you. So is it, is it an issue that you've heard? About bed bugs? Yeah. Oh, of course. With the seniors? Yes. Do you track any of that? Uh, no, we're not able to track it. We hear mostly about it through senior centers. Through what? Senior centers. Uh-huh. And uh, is there any, uh, are there any agencies that you're able to refer people out to that deal with this issue? You know, I'd have to get back to you on that. Okay. I'm not, uh, I don't have an answer for you right now. Okay, I really would like to follow up on that because it continues to be an issue um, in my district and, and, and I guess other areas as well. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councilmember Drum. I mean, that issue, I think it's, it happens in many districts. Um, but then we do have some experts <laughs> because some of the senior building um, director, they tell me that they've become expert on issues like that. So we can also give you some referrals. Uh, Council Member Rose have question. Thank you, Chair. Um, you know, more people are leaving New York City, the city region, um, than any other major metropolitan area in the country. According to uh, statistics, more than one million people moved out of the New York area to other parts of the country since 2010 at a rate of 4.4 percent. The highest negative net migration rate among the nation's largest population centers. Um, and if we're going to remain truly a diverse and vibrant city, we should be doing everything we can to retain our seniors and the incredible knowledge and experience that they bring. And so I, I was really concerned about several things. Um, the, the numbers, when, when you read the numbers of seniors that receive services, um, aging in place services on Staten Island, it was appreciably um, disproportionate to the other boroughs. And, um, and you said that uh, that probably is due to the type of housing that we have. And, and I have to agree that um, we don't have the large numbers of subsidized housing, um, rent-controlled housing, um, but we have a lot of privately owned housing. Um, and understanding this, what measures have you taken to, to increase the, the resources and the support that seniors who live in Staten Island, who live in privately owned houses, um, are able to um, access these services? And, um, and, and what's being done to, to market and make this, um, these programs known to the seniors? Because the response that I get from my constituents is that they don't know about these programs. So I know I asked you two things. Um, you know, I'm really concerned about how we balance the inequities um, that we see in terms of resources for seniors aging in place in privately owned homes. Yes, ab uh, absolutely. Um, the statistics that I read are actually uh, seniors that are in privately owned homes. The, the uh, vast majority of uh, home repairs for these programs are done um, in uh, homes, one to four family unit homes that are owned by a low income homeowner, uh, elderly homeowner, 60, age 60 and above. So these are, these are actually for the, uh, the privately owned communities. And the numbers, um, you know, you know, Staten Island actually did have quite a number of uh, of, of, re of people that received repairs if from this one specific program, but it doesn't reflect the number of people that are served uh, overall with aging services by any means. It's, it's actually a much larger number. However. Um, uh, we do, both of these programs do extensive outreach in multiple languages, um, and the department provides information on these programs at, um, such as uh, at health fairs, or certainly anytime we get referrals uh, or questions from the public about home repair or uh, home modification, we would then re refer to these programs as well. Um, we can always talk with you more about how, you know, if there are specific uh, programs that you would, we can share this information with you to um, work well, on. Well, I'm, I'm really expensive. concerned about, you know, the numbers. Um, there's quite a disparity between the numbers of seniors on Staten Island that are receiving services from these programs. And, um, and we have a very large senior population. Mm -hmm. And so, 
I want to know what you're going to do in terms of making sure that more seniors receive these services. Well, we can work with the programs to do additional outreach in Staten Island and look into this a little bit more carefully to see um, whether these are income eligible homeowners. I'm not sure if that's a factor or not. And as um, we had discussed earlier, but we can certainly look at all the factors for this that, uh, that accompany these programs and see what more can be done. So I have a commitment from you that we're gonna have a, another conversation. Um, oh, be happy to have, how... have a, absolutely be happy to have a conversation with you about this further, yes. Okay, and um, uh, you know, given the current climate in Washington, D.C., is the minor repairs program endangered? Um, mm -hmm. uh, is the funding endangered? OMB has assured us that at least for the next fiscal year, fiscal year 19, um, the funds are in place. We don't know after that. We don't know. We, well, nobody knows after that. And um, if they are, if we are impacted, um, what is the dollar figure? What does that look like? How much is that? The amount of the contract on an annual basis is uh, 414000 I think, or 417 uh, About 10% of that is funded by the city now, so um, I think it's around 389 something like that, 389000 roughly. That comes from the federal government, so that's what... And that serves about approximately how many seniors? About 2,500. 2,500. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Diaz? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning, everyone. Uh, you are, your name is Karen Taylor, and you are an assistant commissioner. Correct. Oh, what is the commissioner name? Our commissioner is Donna Carrado. Right. Commissioner of the Department for the Aging. We have eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight council members attending this first hearing. Uh, There's a special reason why the commissioner cannot come herself. Is, is there any special reason why the commissioner didn't come in person herself. I believe she wasn't available to come. Is any special reason why? But she, but she will, but she is planning to be at the budget hearing. What was that? She is planning to be at the budget hearing. Not, th she's not available, she wasn't available at this time to be at this particular hearing, but she will be available at the budget hearing, which I believe is scheduled for later in March. I think that this is, this is, this is our first public hearing trying to find out the needs of your department mm -hmm. before the budget hearing so we could help. But the commissioner is not here today. And I'm saying, hey, we got a a council member here. We woke up early. Well, I'm speaking to on be her here. behalf. We came. Let me. We came all the way here. I came from the Bronx. Mm -hmm. I had to get up at <laughs> five o'clock in the morning so I could beat all the traffic. I'm here. We got. I got seven colleagues here, but the commissioner is not here. Don't you find that the respectful? I'm sorry, sir, I can't comment on that, actually. Uh, let me ask you a question. Okay. Uh, what is the, talk to me about what is the, the, the minor repair program? What is that? The minor repair program, um, I, I read a description of it in the testimony. It is a, a program that is contracted out to a community-based organization, the New York Foundation for Senior Citizens. They receive funding to hire uh, social service and repair staff 
to make minor repairs in the homes of elderly homeowners who are income eligible, which means that they have to be of moderate or low income according to HUD guidelines, uh, and that they uh, have a need for uh, minor home repair, such as some of the things that I mentioned earlier. Uh, minor plumbing, whether some minor weatherization, some uh, tasks to upkeep the home that they are no longer able to do. Will you, will you say that that is a very important program for senior citizens? Yes, I do. I think it's very important. Yes. Very important. I represent the Bronx, mm. an, an area where we have many Hispanic senior citizens. Mm -hmm. Bangladesh and others. Mm -hmm. What is what is specific are you doing to reach them so they could be aware uh, of this great uh, program? So what is it what you're doing uh, specific in those areas? I can't speak to specifically in that area, but citywide, these programs do. No, I'm no, no, I'm not talking. I'm not citywide. I'm talking about we have not only. I'm talking about the Bronx, but I'm pretty sure this over. We got Chinese. We have mm -hmm. all kind of, of senior mm -hmm. citizen, uh, different culture, different languages. Mm -hmm. And you, and you, I ask, I ask you if, the, if you think that this is a very important project, a very important program. So if it's a very important program, how? Your department is making sure that seniors uh, with that are not English proficiency mm. uh, could they be? How could they? How, how do they get aware of this? Program? Well, all of our all of our contracted programs are required through local law to have um, a process in place to address limited English proficiency. And in this case, these programs would as well. So if they do not have the language expertise on staff, they are expected to access the language line or other language access uh, providers or pro programs that can help them uh, relate, uh, communicate with, and serve people with many different languages. So that's, that's a requirement of all of our DIFTA programs. When was the last time that you visited Senior citizen like Casa Boricua. Oh, Casa Boricua, yeah. I've, uh, it's been a little while, a few months maybe, but I've been a yeah. and, and we also, we, yes, we had a public hearing at Casa Boricua last fall, and uh, which I attended. You know, I was a founder of Casa Boricua. Yeah. And, and, and that's one of the best programs, but also James Monroe. James Monroe, uh, been there uh, Bronx too. River. Uh, in the Bronx River. Yeah. Douglas, Douglas Leo. I mean, we have programs that need that. Pro we have centers that really need a program like this. But I don't see the department making an effort to reach them so they could benefit from the program. Mm -hmm. I, uh, the seniors that live in the. I don't blame you. I'm blaming the commissioner. Excuse me? I am not blaming you, I'm blaming the commissioner. Well, but the seniors that um, are the recipients of these particular programs, we have a, we have a huge variety of other programs, of all of, of programs in uh, my particular area oversees the senior centers. And we certainly have a wide variety of services that are available through senior centers. These particular programs of home repair do have rather strict guidelines as to who they can serve, and they are um, predominantly for low-income homeowners. So it may depend on the neighborhood um, and- Thank you. As to what? And uh, please convey the commissioner my uh, concern about she's not being presented. Okay. We are a council member woke up early to be here to help the department. It would have been very, very nice, very comfortable to have seen her okay. also waking up early. You will, you will have an opportunity Thank shortly. You.
Thank you. Uh, we've been also joined by uh, Council Member Eugene and Council Member Deutsch. Uh, Council Member Ayala, you have a question? Good morning. Thank you, Madam Chair. So my question is really around the guide. It's a beautiful guide, very colorful, has a lot of really great ideas, but how are we getting these into the hands of landlords and what incentive is there for a landlord to actually um, take these recommendations and implement them? Sorry. Uh, the department has um, broadly distributed the guide. We've performed a, um, a number of outreach and marketing uh, strategies, or we've developed a number of outreach and marketing strategies, including printing 500 copies for distribution, and this was made possible due in large part to grant funding secured by the New York chapter of the American Institute of Architects. As mentioned in the testimony, this grant also allowed us to have the guide translated into other languages. Um, now available in English, Spanish, and Chinese. In addition to hosting a well-attended kickoff event, the attendees of which included architects, design professionals, Chairperson Chin, and other elected officials, and Deputy Mayor Bury, the guide has been promoted online, on social media, as well as in print media, including the New York Times, Architectural Digest, and in other smaller publications. Finally, efforts to raise public awareness of the guide remain ongoing. Our outreach outreach teams at the department continue to publicize it at community meetings and events, and we're also pleased to report that the guide will be excerpted in the forthcoming Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum publication, The Senses, Design Beyond Vision. Uh, so that's the res response regarding marketing and outreach. I think the, um, your question about whether uh, what incentives landlords have, um, there is no legal these are not laws, uh, they are recommendations, and that um, the incentive would hopefully be to provide a better environment for the seniors that are aging in their buildings and to maintain, maintain stability in their buildings. So I, I guess maybe HPD, um, is there any effort on HPD's part to maybe have a conversation with your portfolio of landlords? Sure. Um, that is actually exactly what we're trying to do right now as part of uh, the Seniors First initiative. So we worked closely with uh, DIPTA on the advisory committee. And um, the guide is one of the documents that we are using to determine best practices so that we can integrate those practices into renovation scopes. So when a building owner comes to us to finance renovations, um, the assessment that we're doing is actually in the process of being updated right now to incorporate some of the best practices from the guide. Uh, in addition to that, um, the apartment-related specific work, so interior to the apartment uh, type work, um, we are incorporating some of those recommendations into a resident survey that um, we are gonna be piloting uh, this year. And I think my final question, I'm not sure if uh, maybe Difta can respond. Has there been any conversation with um, the admin about maybe, uh, or maybe with NYCHA about home repairs? Because I mean, they're one of our largest landlords and um, oftentimes, you know, we, we, in my district, I have several uh, NYCHA senior developments and we, they don't have supers. Uh, seniors often struggle opening windows, changing light bulbs. There isn't anyone that they can actually, you know, physically call because oftentimes these are not uh, the uh, required job, you know, duties of the uh, the the buildings, the, the developments uh, superintendent. Um, and there isn't a maintenance person that actually does this work. So, has there been any conversation with NYCHA about implementing some of these recommendations? Um, I don't think any direct. Conversations? No, not at this point, no. I think they just got other avenues that they're looking at. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want to follow up. The, the program that the council uh, fund, the Metro, um, Metro Pair program, Project Metro Pair, on that program, there, I don't think there's an income guideline, is there?
I think there is, but I don't believe I have. Okay, I guess the agency said there is an income guideline. There is, I believe. Okay, thank you. All right, but it's also, it doesn't, um, it's not limited to just homeowners. Correct. Right? So following what um, council member Ayala asked, if someone lives in NYCHA um, and found out about uh, this program, they actually could get service. It's possible. I, I think that, you know, as uh, my understanding is that it would have to be done in discussion with the landlord, whoever the landlord is, and in that case it would have to be with NYCHA to um, sort things out to see whether this is something NYCHA should be doing or whether it's something that, uh, you know, that, that uh, that NYCHA would want to be involved in. I mean, some of the types of work uh, the landlord might if either want to have a, a role in because of certainly quality standards and so forth. So it would depend. But theoretically, I guess that's true. I mean, it's same thing with um, seniors who are living in red regulated buildings yeah. and private apartment. If they found out about this program and if they call up to ask, you know, fixing Changing a light bulb, you might not get your landlord because a lot of buildings don't even have supers and they don't um, do this kind of uh, assistant. Uh, so that this this might be an opportunity to really let more senior knows. Mm -hmm. um, some of my colleagues have asked questions about in terms of outreach, right? So just based on um, DIFTA's other program, does uh, DIFTA's um, the caregiver? Uh, provider, the 10 provider that DIFTA funds, do they all have information about the, the aging in place guide? I will have to find out from the caregiver, uh, from the caregiver program and let you know. I think it's been widely distributed among all of our programs, but I will double check with you and get back to you. I hope so. I mean, that's the, really the basic Right? I mean, these are programs funded by DIFTA. Because what I'm you know, referring to is that um, we also should make sure that caregivers know about all these home repair programs that are available so that they can assist uh, the seniors that they take care of. Yeah, I mean, the, the booklet actually is targeting, I just got a note here, is targeting landlords. Um, I think caregivers, there's certainly a role for caregivers in, uh, in that process, but um, the booklet is really for landlords. It is for landlord, but I'm saying that for um, all your housing programs. Oh, for that, yes, absolutely. That are available, oh, yes. yeah, right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But even, I think, even, even this is for landlords, but it's they, good they, they should know about it. It's like everyone should know about it so that at least they know what they can ask the landlord, right, to, to do. Yes, point uh, So that is something that I think all caregivers, even just basically all those programs, should have this uh, information. We'll make sure um, I wanted to ask, uh, in your testimony from um, HBD, uh, Commissioner uh, Darga, um, you didn't mention the, um, you didn't talk about HBD's uh, home fix program. Yeah. That was in the mayor's updated housing 2.0 plan. Yes. So that programs, I uh, wanted to know how many seniors do you anticipate uh, will be served uh, by this program and then senior who participate um, in this program, would they be referred to other um, city resources and how do you coordinate with DIFTA on this? Uh, those are good questions. So um, currently we have a homeowner repair program that is uh, focused on senior, senior homeowners, uh, age 60 plus, uh, which is our citi senior citizen home assistance program. Um, that program um, funds renovations to uh, single family or one to four unit um, uh, owner occupied properties. Um, where the homeowner has owned it for at least two years. That program, along with um, um, 
uh, our other homeowner programs, which are administered through uh, Neighborhood Housing Services today, um, uh, all available also for seniors, will actually be replaced by our new Home Fix program. Um, so they are still currently active and they are still accepting applications. The new Home Fix program um, will be open to senior homeowners as well as any other homeowner. And we are actively looking at ways to incorporate some of the best practices around aging in place into the type of work that we're able to fund through the new program. Um, one of the, I think the second set of questions was around how we connect then those owners with other potential services and support. HPD doesn't actually provide the services directly, but we are talking with um, DIFTA as well as other city agencies about how we can refer or better connect those homeowners then with other relevant services. Well, I guess related to the, the minor home repair that DIFTA um, oversee that's funded by the federal government, the good thing about that program is that there's a social worker that go, or someone go in there and really assess the situation. Uh, so that is something that I think HPD could uh, collaborate with DIFTA to see, I mean, if you could get into that home, I mean, that's what, you know, Councilmember Ballone was talking about. It's really, you'll be able to access much more information that could be helpful Absolutely. Uh, to the senior. Um, so we don't want to lose that opportunity, so we want to make sure that we could uh, collect the data and you really use that to get them additional services that they might need. Absolutely. Um, now, HPD, what programs do you have that are available to help people who are renters, uh, seniors have, who are renters? We have, we have a lot of programs that actually help renters, but they, um, they're focusing, they focus on providing assistance to the owner of the property, right, so not directly to the renter itself. So I think if you had an individual renter within a building that needed to access certain improvements and the owner was not participating in an HPD program, it would make more sense that that uh, renter then go and seek assistance through one of DIFTA's programs. Uh, for landlords that are participating in our programs, um, through our new Seniors First initiative, we are incorporating, right, let me step back. The goal is really on our end, not just pr to produce 100% as senior affordable developments, but rather to better serve seniors through all of the work that the agency does. Right. So our goal is 300,000 new construction and preserved units by 2026. Our goal is that in basically every preservation project that we are doing, um, when we are working with an owner, that we are going to look at the um, assessment, not just the building needs, not just from the perspective of what in the building is broken, but where are there opportunities to make it a building that's safer for residents to age in place. Because what we know is that there actually are a number of senior residents in mm -hmm. every building that we serve. Um, and that's gonna be done through the actual needs assessment, which will look at the building itself, so common areas, um, kind of uh, entrance to the building, et cetera, as well as um, uh, then coupling that with a resident survey, mm -hmm. which will be delivered to residents and the residents will be able to actually elect other um, uh, work inside of their individual apartments, um, which would include some of the best practices that we've discussed today, so you know, grab bars, non-slip flooring, et cetera. So the person doing the assessment mm -hmm. is someone who's trained, um, sort of know about aging in place, what's, so, what's needed and what's required? The, um, so this is the, our integrated physical needs assessment. Right? Um, most lenders, when they are financing renovations to properties, require a physical needs assessment. Over the last couple years, we've made it a more holistic assessment. So we now account for energy efficiency, um, health redu reduction of health hazards in housing, and now the latest edition will be um, thinking about ways to help uh, residents age more safely in their homes. Um, that is done by a professional engineer. The, f the engineering firms are qualified under um, an RFQ. It's a rolling RFQ. And um, then we actually do kind of train the trainer type events with those firms. So um, we will be sharing kind of some of the work around best practices with those engineering firms so that when we're, they're going out and assessing the building, they understand what they're looking for. 
Now, in preparing for um, today's hearing, we found out there are many different programs from the states, right? There's uh, access to home residential emergency service, um, the restore program. So there are different programs that are uh, funded by the state. Uh, and then um, we also find out that there are actually some resources from Medicaid and Medicare that could be used um, to help a senior modify uh, their home? I think the, uh, the Medicare, Medicaid question is mostly around um, equipment. Uh, Medicare doesn't pay for any kind of home modifications. Medicaid, however, could be uh, useful under the Nursing Home Transition and Diversion Waiver Program. Uh, this uses Medicaid funding to provide support and services including minor home modifications to assist seniors and individuals with disabilities uh, to uh, make a trans successful transition from a nursing facility. Uh, but it's mostly, I believe, related to equipment and it's, um, you know, limited. So it's not everyone who has Medicaid. You have to be in a particular um, situation and transition from a nursing home. There are also some programs that are loan programs, right, from in HPD. I mean, do you have any statistic in terms of how many seniors have access to those, like the, the Restore program? I'm actually, so the Restore program is a state program. Mm -hmm. I'm not very familiar with that. I'm, I'm certainly happy to reach out to the state and understand a little bit more about it and also think about how we could work with the state to deploy that more effectively. The funding doesn't come through through HPD to a, to a minister? No? Not that I'm aware of, no. The, the programs that we have to actually assist, and this is homeowners specifically, um, are the NHS programs that we, so we help fund and work on with them, including uh, Project Help, which is a city, city council uh, funded homeowner uh, initiative. Um, we also have our senior citizen home assistance program. Um, we don't administer any other single family repair programs today um, outside of those programs. Okay. But I would love some more information about that. I think the, the main point is really how do we make sure that um, residents, homeowner, renters know about these programs so that they can also request assistance and then offer HPD to really help us in terms of preservation to let landlord know that these programs are available and how we can work with them. I mean, even with the aging in place guy, it would be great for landlord to know that there are resources available to help them do those modifications so there is some incentive for them to be a little bit more involved and, and really take the initiative uh, to do that. Uh, putting a handrail, um, let's say, along the hallway definitely will help a senior navigate when they're going up and down the stairs, uh, but getting the landlord to do that voluntarily, unless there are programs that can help them, you know, I think that we really have to make sure that they know about these programs and then we can access them. Yeah, absolutely, we agree. Um, and just, I, I would say, on the outreach on our end, we do uh, extremely extensive outreach both to homeowners as well as multifamily building owners. Um, it's certainly a challenge because um, single family home ownership um, and especially small multifamily home ownership is the ownership is fairly fragmented. Um, but we've developed a series of outreach kind of programs over the last four or five years, including property resource clinics, uh, our landlord and pilot landlord ambassador program, um, where we're doing regular outreach, and we are always looking for ways to collaborate with community groups and elected officials to try to get out to the right folks. Um, so I would certainly encourage, um, encourage you know, anybody to reach out to us. 
Um, in addition, on homeowners specifically, we work really closely for the Center for New York City Neighborhoods um, to make sure that homeowners have appropriate counseling. And I think we could think about ways that we could deploy the resource guide through them as well, as through the work that we do with landlords. Yeah, I think moving forward, I mean, there's 51 council members. And there are districts where there are a lot more homeowners, like in, uh, in Queens and Brooklyn, Staten Island. Um, then there are places, districts, where there are a lot of uh, renters. But I think it will be good for DIFTA and, uh, and HPD to really work with each of the council members um, to do the outreach, whether it's conducting homeowner uh, uh, fairs and information, just to really get out there. Because I know that the resources are limited, and it's good that even with that limited resource for minor home repair, you're able to serve a lot of seniors. Um, I was just surprised it was just a small pot of money uh, from the federal government. Um, so maybe we could show the needs and we can um, either get the city to match it um, to make sure that the resources are available. Um, you have any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you for uh, coming in to testify today and we look forward to working with you um, on expanding these programs. Thank you. Thank you. We are going to call up the next panel. Okay. Uh, from Live On New York, Andrea Siafrani, uh, Refer Stuyvesant Restoration Corporation, Dr. Indira at uh, Warren. Alexander Riley from the Legal Aid Society, Christine Hunter from AIA New York Chapter, and Molly Kokrowski from JASA. Please begin. Sure. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Councilmember Chair Chin, uh, Councilmember Vallone. Um, thank you very much for calling this hearing today. Um, we were also so pleased to see such a great um, group of council members throughout this hearing um, to talk about this important issue. So thank you again. Um, we really look forward to working with the entire council and the city um, moving forward this year. Uh, my name is Andrea Chanfrani. I'm the Director of Public Policy at Live On New York. Um, Live On New York, as you know, um, has about 100 members, community-based organizations throughout New York City that provide services, including affordable senior housing, senior centers, home-delivered meals, elder abuse prevention services, and many others to older adults in New York City. Uh, first and foremost today, we're, we're here to talk um, and, and proud to talk about the work of our Affordable Senior Housing Coalition, which is comprised of more than 20 of the leading non-for-profit developers of affordable senior housing with services here in New York City. Um, this coalition and through the work of Live On New York, we recognize that enabling seniors to help age in place is more than just bricks and mortar and buildings, but really about fostering connections to the community and promoting healthy living overall. Given the mission-driven nature of our, the member organizations, uh, many offer social services, such as senior centers or service coordinators that enrich the lives of thousands of older New Yorkers each year, in addition to an affordable roof over their tenants' heads. We believe that in addition to the housing itself, these types of community-based services are integral to fostering the aging in place model. For seniors, uh, we all know the ability to age in place can have a positive effect on overall health, impr including improving cognitive outcomes, reducing rates of depression, and preventing social isola isolation. HUD has found that 89% of Americans over 50 wish to age in place for as long as possible, and further, as highlighted in a recent AARP study, supporting aging in place can help ward against quote-unquote overcare, which in 
which occurs when individuals are forced to make the costly move um, to more elevated um, situations of living, including nursing homes, simply due to the fact that the residential options are unavailable, unaffordable, or inaccessible. Beyond the internal value for seniors who are able to age in place, the presence of older New Yorkers in the neighborhoods they've helped build builds a positive impact on the entire community. And this is something that we really like to talk about a lot at Live On New York and really highlight the, what seniors mean to our communities. Um, seniors improve these communities through their commitment to civ civic engagement, volunteerism, and assisting with the care of younger future generations through caregiving. In effect, the inability for seniors to age in place would not only have a negative impact on their own quality of life, but would tear at the fabric that makes New York's communities so vibrant and cohesive. The uh, vacancy rate is something we also wanted to highlight today here. In New York City, uh, the sparse availability of affordable housing hovers around 4%, and many older New Yorkers live on fixed incomes, as we all know, so they face very limited options for housing that meets their needs. Um, further, currently less than 5% of housing is considered accessible for individuals with an even a mo moderate mobility difficulties, and this heightens the need for um, accessible affordable housing. As we know, we sit here today at the hearing, the population continues to rise and the needs will continue to rise. Um, and we are very pleased that the city, the council, as well as the city is really looking at this issue from a number of angles. We know we can't just um, produce more housing and that would solve the problem. We also need, know we need to look at preservation, things like SCREE that was mentioned here, um, things like the home repair programs, as well as the production of new affordable um, senior housing. So we are very pleased with the city's work in these areas and look forward to continuing to partner in those efforts. Um, we do want to highlight in Housing 2.0, which you heard about today, we were very pleased to see the increased emphasis on the needs of seniors um, and the Seniors First initiatives. In the plan, uh, Mayor de Blasio increased the city's commitment to not only construct or preserve a total of 15,000 units of senior housing, but to serve an additional 15,000 seniors through age-friendly improvements and modifications. We're excited to collaborate with HPD as well as DIFTA and the city to ensure the success of all facets of the Seniors First initiatives within Housing 2.0 um, continue to, to address these challenges that we, we continue to face. We know that home modifications, as we've heard today, can be a very uh, low cost and cost effective way to improve, improve the stock of affordable housing and help preserve that housing and, and keep it seniors in their homes. We also recognize and, and um, the importance of the impactful minor repairs program that DIFTA runs that we heard um, quite a bit about today. And we, as always, we look forward to continuing to work to increase and um, strengthen those programs. Um, we also just wanted to raise the importance, and we've talked about this for many years, um, advocating for the city to um, continue to, or to establish a funding for stream for service coordinators in affordable senior housing buildings. Um, I really wanted to highlight, you've probably heard, the self, recent self-help study that's found some incredible data on the importance of having a um, service coordinator in housing and how it can really um, increase health outcomes um, in a positive way. It's just some um, highlights from that study. Um, service coordinators have been found to positively impact their health outcomes of tenants, um, finding that residents with access to a service coordinator as compared to other seniors in the community experience 68% lower odds of being hospitalized, um, 1,778 average Medicaid payment per person per hospitalization for self-help residents versus uh, over $5,000 for the comparison group, and a 53% lower odds of visiting an ER compared to a non-self-help resident. So these are some really great statistics that are starting to look at the impacts of aging in place with some um, supports, and we're really excited to, to continue to work to move this forward. Um, the one last thing I wanted to highlight that came up um, quite a bit today, and thank you, Councilmember Chin, for always raising this, is the awareness that's needed in the communities for these programs that do exist, as well as um, raising awareness for possible new programs. Um, we're always ready, willing, and able to talk about how we at um, Live On can assist in these efforts and help spread awareness of these great programs that are helping seniors stay in their communities. So um, we'll continue that drumbeat as well, and thank you for raising that um, always on not just the programs here today, but all the great programs that are being um, offered for seniors. And then um, as that awareness grows, we know we can continue, continue to advocate for more. So thank you for your work, um, and we look forward to working with you as we move forward. Good morning, my name is Christine Hunter. I'm a principal at Magnuson Architecture and Planning in New York City and also 
a current co-chair of the Design for Aging Committee at the American Institute of Architects New York chapter. Over the past eight years, our interdisciplinary committee of architects, interior designers, and other professionals has been looking at the environmental challenges facing the growing number of seniors who will be aging in place over the next quarter century throughout the five boroughs. And everyone has talked about, you know, how New Yorkers or seniors prefer to age in place, so I won't beat that horse. Um, that said, many existing buildings, not to mention the infrastructure of many neighborhoods, were not designed to conform with current accessibility code provisions and present hazards for older residents or limitations to their mobility. As they grow frail, some seniors become isolated because it's not easy to navigate from their apartment to the street, or in other cases, they experience totally preventable falls that then lead to hospitalizations. We applaud the City Council for their prior initiatives and concern for passing the Local Law 51. Um, we were delighted to work with DIFTA, to be invited by DIFTA and work with them to create the guide. And we did feel that the guide was very useful or is very useful to both seniors themselves and their families. That was one reason we, as a committee, put in the grant application to translate the guide. And in, in relation to, um, to dissemination, uh, you know, hard copies are expensive to print. We did print more copies than original of, in each language, and we, but we also printed cards which in three languages which provide the, um, the digital link to the online PDFs of each version. And so what, what we're intending to do is to try and get both hard copy, you know, a set of hard copies and a big stack of cards to every council person's local office, every community board, and we'd like to do every senior center. That was sort of our initial idea about dissemination. I'm sure there's a lot more that can be done and we'd be very happy to work with the city and maybe get assistance from the city in, in getting the word out. Because um, we do, I think a lot of people just, it doesn't occur to them what's, you know, getting in their parents' way or, or how, how easy it might be to make certain things easier. Um, in terms of next steps, the challenge is how to encourage or incentivize private owners to make what are in most cases fairly simple changes both within dwelling units and throughout the common areas of a building. Uh, financial rebates or credits would get the widest participation by owners. However, we recognize that this would take time and a lot of political will to put in place. Um, more immediately, we would support and be very happy to, you know, help to develop um, pilot, a pilot renovation project which could really um, you know, on a set of existing buildings, perhaps some owned by a nonprofit owner, for instance, that could, um, you know, where you could really quantify costs and understand better after the pilot program how to put a larger program into place. Um, so the AIA and, and the Design for Aging Committee have been collaborating for a number of years with both with the New York Academy of Medicine on their Age-Friendly Neighborhood Initiative as well as with numerous city agencies, including HPD, DIFTA, the DOB, and NYCHA. We look forward to continued work together to help the city's seniors, who ultimately are all of us, to be self health, safe, excuse me, healthy, and fully engaged in the life of the city. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much for this opportunity to, to speak on this important issue. My name is Alex Riley. Uh, until just a couple of weeks ago, I was the director of the Elderly Project with a, an organization called Volunteers of Legal Service, where I worked with uh, New York's leading law firms to obtain free, le free legal assistance for seniors in Manhattan, and where I shifted the focus during those the four years when I led that project to uh, the goal of aging in place. 
But just about a week ago, I uh, went back to the Legal Aid Society, where I'd previously worked as a staff attorney in Legal Aid's Brooklyn office for the aging. I'm now there at, in a newly created position, which is Director of Elder Law for the Civil Practice. So Council Member uh, Chairwoman Chin mentioned this is the year of the senior. Um, the creation of this position, I think, uh, reflects Legal Aid Society's um, renewed emphasis on, on uh, focusing on this population. Um, so in addition to thanking the committee for this opportunity to speak, I wanted to thank particularly Councilmember Drum, if you were uh, here, for having raised the very issue that I came to speak about, uh, which has to do with the, uh, the need for assistance for older adults to move heavy objects in their apartments um, that, uh, in which they are renters. Uh, so I was last here a few months ago testifying on the bill that Councilmember Drum uh, referred to having to do with providing assistance to seniors with um, preparing their apartments for bed bug eradication. And at the end of the testimony I prepared uh, in, with respect to that bill, I noted the larger problem of seniors being unable to move heavy furniture or other objects in their apartments uh, that their landlords claim uh, prevent the correction of certain housing code violations. So for example, there might be a sideboard that is blocking access to crumbling plaster on the wall. There might be a heavy dresser that's blocking access to uh, rotting floorboards that, that, cause a, that uh, constitute a, a trip hazard. There might be a bookcase that is blocking access to a collapsed ceiling, all these kinds of issues. I've been involved in, uh, and I also, I should say, um, I apologize for not having uh, written testimony to provide, but as I say, I've been at Legal Aid for about a week, and I just haven't <laughs> had time to prepare it. Um, uh, but uh, hopefully I, I can put something together after this. Um, but I've, over the years, I've been involved in a number of um, housing court litigation uh, cases where we obtained a, an order from a judge requiring the landlord to fix uh, a housing code violation and everything grinds to a halt because the landlord says we can't do it, we can't get access. Some of these claims by landlords are pretexts, they just don't want to do the work, but some of these claims are legitimate. They don't want the liability of asking their workers to move heavy pieces of furniture that may have some value and uh, it's it's been impossible in many cases to, to move things forward. So, as I said last time, I, I testified on the subject of the, the uh, legislation pertaining to bed bugs. Um, I urge the committee to consider perhaps companion or similar legislation that would create a program uh, that would offer a, really a very simple and limited service to seniors who cannot move heavy objects um, to facilitate repairs uh, that would allow this kind of work to be done uh, would have to be done uh, at the beginning of the repair, repair process and then the service would have to come back to presumably move the, the furniture back. I was um, encouraged to see that, I, I believe it's called the Metro Pair uh, program, seems to have, uh, according to some of the testimony we heard, um, an element relating to furniture repair. So it doesn't seem like too great a leap to envision a program that would uh, permit the mere movement of furniture. And in some instances, this could really be a, a, a lifesaver for a senior who's living with a life-threatening housing code violation that can't be repaired simply because they, they lack the strength and the, uh, the resources to move the objects on their own. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, my name is Molly Krakowski. I'm Director of Legislative Affairs at JASA, and I want to thank the Council and Councilmember Chin for hosting today's hearing. I also was just inspired to speak today, um, so I don't have anything for you um, per se, but I wanted to highlight um, sort of two areas that I guess um, kind of complement Alex um, in that looking at sort of the bigger picture. And so JASA has a, a contract currently for the signed council project, which is to provide assistance, legal assistance to older adults in housing court in Queens. And um, you have, you know, there are requirements to be eligible, a senior has to be 60 years or older, have an identifiable social service need and pending housing court case. 
Um, and seniors could be facing eviction due to non-payment of rent or holdover allegations, et cetera. Um, and, and then the lawyer, the sort of the team of the legal and the social service are able to connect the person and hopefully help them uh, with the housing court case, but also set them up with services. And the reason why I bring this up is because um, the newer legislation having to do with universal access um, to, um, to lawyers in housing court doesn't really take the place of a signed counsel project, and it's not meant to, um, but there are a lot of seniors who don't fit into the universal access because of their income requirements. Um, they're just above the 200% um, poverty limit, and they're really in need of assistance, and the signed counsel project is funded at a level that really doesn't allow fully to address the needs of older adults in court, so that our lawyers are able to address maybe 10% of the seniors who come through the courts in, in Queens. So um, seniors are attractive targets for landlords looking to harass and evict longtime uh, tenants uh, with lower rents. Uh, there are about 200,000 older adults who are on waiting lists for senior affordable housing. And um, certainly we're very eager to see what comes with the um, mayor's initiatives to try and preserve and create additional affordable housing. We're looking to partner in any which way we can. Um, but between the housing court issue and not having the lawyers that are spe um, specifically there for older adults, um, and then the bed bugs, which uh, we also testified to um, intro 189, um, and council member Drum's um, legislation. Uh, one of the biggest things that we also have been finding, obviously aside from just trying to go in and address a very challenging need that's not limited to older adults in New York City, um, is um, the challenge that, um, that comes with moving the furniture and really preparing um, in every which way these apartments to be, um, to be handled. And um, this is a need that we obviously don't see declining. Um, uh, despite preventative measures, outbreaks are gonna be inevitable. Um, and we would really just look to the city to see what in fact they could do in any way to assist um, in, in this challenge. It's, it's something that JAS has taken on um, significant financial um, strain in trying to address obviously these needs within our buildings. Um, and where we can with clients. And, um, and so uh, when we're looking at sort of the issue of home repair, uh, we are sort of uh, pulling out a more macro view of um, the larger picture of what allows people to age in place. And um, it's not limited to home repairs, but it goes really hand in hand with preserving the housing for the older adults, which um, has ramifications in all sorts of different areas. So again, we look forward to continuing to partner with the city to provide affordable housing, um, to think about possible solutions um, to some of these issues. And thank you for hosting today's hearing. Thank you. So the, the project that you have, the assigned council project, so that one, there is no income requirement? Um, it's not limited. It, the income requirement is not the chief component, no. And that's a minister? Through under, DIFTA. Through DIFTA. Yeah. Okay. When they were looking at the universal um, uh, council, um, we were involved in uh, the initial conversations. One of the things that our lawyers um, and our legal um, services were really trying to highlight was the need for when there was that rollout to put seniors in sort of the first category of people who were very much at need of counsel in housing court. And um, the response was more or less, there's the assigned council project, and then this is going to be by zip codes and by other factors in terms of who needs and trying to um, focus on families and, and other um, populations. Uh, but there are these people who fall into that gap then. So either expand assigned council project um, funding um, or figure out a way to um, address the more immediate needs of seniors who are facing eviction and mm -hmm. um, serious challenges. Do you, do you know offhand what's the budget for the assigned council project? I don't know. Maybe somebody else knows. I know that there's also an R, I mean, there was just an RFP, so, um, so it's, uh, but I don't, know the, I don't know the budget offhand. You have to go through an RFP for that. 
project. For the Sign Council project, yeah. Okay, so there must be, a, so if DEFDA can find out for us, yeah, and then we can see maybe through the budget process. Because yeah. uh, that, that could be something that we can uh, work with the council member drum yeah. on. And the same thing with the, uh, the issue about moving furniture, mm -hmm. how to incorporate that with the, um, with the legal component. Yeah. Uh, we can, uh, May I just yes. add something uh, brief? Um, so my, so as I've said before, I, my title is Director of Federal Law for the Civil Practice, but uh, I'm based in our Brooklyn office for the aging uh, at, in downtown Brooklyn, uh, where we have a whole holistic team of lawyers, social workers, and paralegals. We also participate in the ACP program. And an additional limitation is, um, well, first of all, I should say that, that the ACP cases are referred by the court. Judge makes the referral, and there's a whole process. But the, the only cases that are appropriate for ACP referrals are ones where there is both a legal and a social work social services type component. So um, you might have a senior who uh, has a, a very significant legal need, but in the estimation of, of the court, doesn't really have a, a social work need. That case will not be referred or shouldn't be under the guidelines as an ACP referral. But most of the, uh, the legal services agency that the council support, I know that oftentimes we just refer the senior directly um, to legal aid, legal services, um, and they would, they would get the help um, that they need. Uh, yes, that's, that's right. I think the, the previous discussion about ACPs perhaps was a, as an example of where there is targeted funding for, uh, for work, particularly to work with seniors, and the, but there are limitations, although there, there are not, uh, as we understand it, um, income-related limitations specific to that program. There are other kinds of limitations, such as the fact that there must be a social work need in order for such a case to be uh, to be referred, and, and also, uh, again, I'm uh, quite new to my position at Legal Aid, but my understanding is that um, the way uh, the, the financing works for the ACP cases is that um, the providers are paid on a per-case per basis for, uh, for ACPs as opposed to other kinds of uh, grants and programs where a provider receives just a, uh, a sort of lump sum um, amount of money pers uh, pursuant to the grant or an RFP. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming to testify today. And um, I guess we all have to help get the word out that a lot of these wonderful programs are available to our seniors. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else that would like to speak that didn't, uh, you have to sign up? Oh, you did? Oh, wait. Um, did you fill out a form, one of these forms? Maybe, Is there anyone else that wants to testify? Okay. Tom, you have to push the button. Hello. On the, on the mic, you have to push the button on the bottom. Does, does this testimony go anywhere? Does, it, does this testimony go any other place than this room? It's on the record. So anyone can look it up. I, <clears throat> I'm, the reason that I'm here, my name is Tom Connor. I'm, I've been head of the advisory board as my senior senator for many years. Uh, in, in, in the 20 years that I've been going to the senior center, I've never heard about this repair program that they've all been talking about. Uh, there's no outreach, there's no publicity, no one knows anything. It was the same thing with Project CART. The Department for the Aging claimed they had a transportation program. 
No one knew anything about it. I finally discovered that there is such a thing as Project CART. This year, they increased the funding for Project CART, but it's still not really running properly. Now, I want to just uh, talk about the repairs briefly. I think someone else mentioned this, but uh, the New York Foundation for Senior Citizens was paid $414,000 for the year to do the home repairs. They claim they did 5,500. Now, I, being that we've never heard of it, I wonder where do these statistics come from? My, this is what I got from Department for the Aging. But I wondered, does the city council ever check into how they prove what they're doing? They uh, have little uh, stickers now that you're supposed to be, when you come to the senior center, they log you in. However, they always keep saying it's completely inaccurate. So I would really question all of the figures that you get from the Department for the Aging. How do you know that they're accurate? How do you know what is going on there? Yesterday, I spent the whole day, I, I had never heard of this home repair until I heard about this hearing. So I called Department for the Aging to try to find out about it. I called seven people there, no one, <laughs> Every, each one isn't there, a one after the other after the other. And finally, I got someone and she said, well, it's 4.30. I said, I know it's 4.30, but I've been trying to reach someone since two. I said, don't you work until five? There was no answer. There was no one there. There's no one giving information. The whole thing is very poorly run. Now, one of the councilmen said something about bed bugs. He had a uh, bill in for something about bed bugs. And what I wanted to say at the senior center, when someone has bed bugs, they're excluded from the program and they're told that they have to get their landlord to take care of the bugs. Well, frequently the landlord doesn't and the person could be excluded for months from the senior center. Not that any senior wants to sit next to someone that's covered with bugs, but it seems to be somewhat unfair to the person who doesn't have the means to get rid of the bugs. So I don't know what his bill was. He didn't explain it, but I think it might be something to look into. The other thing is, I didn't know what is the eligibility for these home repairs. They seemed to say there was a fee, there was an income eligibility. I'm surprised at that because if you go to the Metropolitan Council Jewish Poverty, there is no income eligibility. And if you need a grab bar, they will do it free. And they're getting money evidently from the city and, and New York Foundation is getting money from the city. So why should one be free and one not be free to a senior who needs it. These are questions that I think another, when uh, Mr. D Diaz uh, spoke, he said he was concerned that the commissioner wasn't here. Well, I was, uh, I was concerned also because the commissioner, when do we ever see her? When can she be questioned? Uh, and then when are there follow-up questions? There were so many instances here today of things that I heard that I felt were not true, but I was not able to say anything about it at the time. So I hope in cl closing, I hope that the committee, Margaret Chin's committee, the senior committee, will be a little bit more aggressive with the Department for the Aging and try to get back up. And I'd like to know Project CART, how many actual people do they serve and how much money have they spent? And I think you're talking about shortage of funds. It's not necessarily a shortage of funds. It's not used properly. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. That's, some of those questions will come up at next month's budget hearing. 
So I invite you back. We have a public session after um, the commissioner testify and the council member ask question. There will be a public session. So we'll make sure we'll let you know when the, the hearing is scheduled. And then there are questions that, that were not answered today or need to be follow up. We will forward those questions over um, to the Department for the Aging. Thank you. And then. Hi. Um, my name is Gail Ressler, and I am an interior designer. I heard about this session through Christine Hunter, and I am a participant with the AIA New York Design for Aging Committee. Um, which I know she spoke earlier with some prepared remarks and I will try not to just repeat. Um, I wanted to just address a couple of things in addition to Christine's comments, uh, particularly coming from my experience as an interior designer. Um, one point that I want to raise is that uh, I saw in the title of the session the word repairs and thought, Hmm, that's not exactly what I think of as the most critical intervention, which often involves really simple interventions, additions. It's true of affluent New Yorkers as well as New Yorkers of more modest means. So things like grab bars, which I know there are some programs um, for funding for that to be done. There is not an awareness from a more broad perspective that that is something that uh, is great for, for example, fall prevention for people of all ages. And whenever we are doing things of any kind of intervention, those things should be autopilot inclusions in the, in the scope. Um, also, I do think that the design knowledge has to go hand in hand with the social work knowledge to really help people in their homes and stay there safely. Um, specifically, I just want to also talk to my colleagues over there from the AIA committee. We've been working on a project to try to address the age friendliness of NYCHA housing. Um, I you know, won't elaborate uh, too excessively, but we are really happy to share the ideas and uh, as the head of the aging committee, you know, we, we would welcome any opportunity to fill you in on, you know, sharing our, our reports and our recommendations on how that could be done because there are interventions that can be done. You know, our larger project is like a $5 million project. That's one animal, but there's also the smaller interventions and I believe Christine spoke about it and shared the user guide for uh, building management. So um, I think, you know, we'd like to see a lot of design process and design knowledge integrated into how to help uh, people who are aging, because I think that that sometimes gets missed. And, you know, when you think of, for example, tripping hazards, you know, part of it's the person and the physical. But part of it is what we see everywhere where the physical environment has created a tripping hazard. And, you know, it would be great to look at where that happens to make interiors more age friendly as well. And that's, that's it. No, thank you. I think we look forward to um, meeting with you and maybe talk more about in terms of nitro housing, because I know a lot of seniors. You know, you ask for reasonable accommodation, not a lot of apartments are accessible. Right. So if they are lucky enough to live in a NYCHA apartment and wanted to continue to live there, if there are things that we can help them kind of um, modify and fix so that they could live there comfortably, we should definitely work would, at it. Would love to share the info with you. Great. Thank well, you. Well, thank you. And thank you for being here today. And thank you for all of you, uh, all of you for participating in today's hearing. And the hearing is now adjourned. Thank you.